Okay. So this is my presentation on layered lemons in Dutch Baroque painting. And I want to start with saying I apologize to the Dutch for trying to pronounce thing and maybe missing a little bit. I do not speak Dutch. Um, all right, so interpreting a 17th century Dutch Baroque Stilleven or Celeste painting as a contemporary viewer um, requires a multivalent approach as the Netherlands were one of the most worldly and prosperous societies of the time. With a global trade network bringing in a wealth of new commodities from worldwide markets, a prosperous stock exchange cultivating a thriving upper class, a highly literate populace, the contemporary Dutch audience had access to a world, a wealth of information through which to view these works and would have been familiar at perceiving these symbols that are only disguised today through the distance of time and culture. Present day audiences may now be less familiar with specific inherent pictorial interpretations of the 17th and 18th century literate populace but we have no issue understanding our own moderate, modern pictorial symbols, the ever-present emoji. In the following analysis, I will use a multivalent historical, cultural, and literary approach in an attempt to interpret one aspect of the still life genre, uh, the lemon, as it appears mainly in the Northern Dutch Republic, Vanitas or Pronk still life, in particular by looking at Willem Kalf's 1662 still life with a Chinese bowl, a Nautilus cup, and fruit. Lemons are a seemingly ubiquitous visual component in 17th century Dutch paintings, even beyond tabletop still life. According to one analysis, between 1500 and 1650, lemons are depicted in 51% of their sampling of Netherlands paintings, as opposed to 16% of Italian work at the same time. The Dutch Golden Age, spanning much of the 17th century, saw the Netherlands as world leaders in trade, science, art, and economic power. A product of Dutch imperial success, lemons arrived on ships or were grown in special citrus hothouses, orangeries. As a visible and edible symbol of the wealth, luxury, and decadence this period of supremacy granted citizens, they were highly desirable. Formerly, formerly seen through the lens of emblem books, objects such as lemons appearing in still life have a much richer cultural capital than to be simply didactic or moralistic. Lemons are a reflection of contemporary Dutch life and prosperity of the 1600s. Eddie de Jong suggests that many 17th century motifs serve these dual functions. They operate as concrete, observable things, while at the same time doing something totally different, namely expressing an idea, a moral, an intention, a joke, or a situation. Peeled, cut in half, or whole, the prominence of lemon imagery suggests several functions, literal, metaphorical, moral, and technical. The meaning of lemons unpeels much like the fruit itself unraveling to reveal a highly varied and significant fruit. A pictorial example of the preeminence of the Dutch trade empire, lemons were a representation of the Dutch primacy in trade. As a very real and consumable object, lemons were a highly exotic commodity, indicative of the successful trade network established by the Dutch Republic after their independence movement from Spain. With the creation of the Republic in 1581, the Dutch aristocracy and the new upper middle class burghers emerged with money to spend on luxury goods, particularly food, including the alluring lemon. The abundant appearance of citrus fruits at this time is emblematic of the Netherlandic victory in this David versus Goliath struggle against the Spanish Habsburg Empire, whose access to the Mediterranean had formally given them a near monopoly on the warmer weather fruit. Costly and coveted in the rest of Europe, lemons are a visual illustration of the rise of the Dutch Golden Age, showcasing the nation's dominance. A well-known earlier example of the status of citrus fruit um, as a wealth signifier in painting can be found in Jan van Eyck's 1434, the Arnold Feeney portrait. 
featuring four oranges among its many symbols of status. Uh, one of the items the rich merchant Arnolfini traded in were oranges, um, which are also notably a symbol of fertility, fecundity, fecundity and nuptials. This is being a wedding portrait and she is pregnant. Lemons first grew as an understory in forests on the foothills of the Himalayas. And according to Toyotoboro Tanaka, the great Japanese citrus expert of the 20th century, all oranges came from Assam and Burma, where they were, wrote, where, where they were known as naranga. More recent research by botanists working in the Chinese region of Yunnan has revealed so many primitive citrus forms that there's reason to believe many species originated in China and were brought to Italy during the Moorish occupation when Arabs planted lemons in Southern Spain, North Africa, and Sicily, which would later be transported across the Alps to Dutch markets. With the establishment of the Dutch trade routes to the East Indies and through the Mediterranean, citrus fruits and plants were able to arrive directly in Amsterdam by boat, heading the markets and tables of any who could afford them. In order to protect these cold sensitive plants from northern winters, citrus greenhouses called orangeries with large windows and opening skylights were created to house the potted trees that could be moved in or outside depending on the weather. These orangeries with their expanses of costly Venetian glass heated from underneath by coal braziers were the ultimate symbol of wealth. And Dutch architects were key in advancing the technology that made it possible to showcase the fragile plants in the cold northern climate. Cultivating these exotic gardens was one way of declaring Netherlandic national identity. The creation of stadtholder Frederick Heinrich, Prince of Orange Nassau's immense gardens and orangeries at Hans Dijk coincided with the foundation of the Dutch Republic, and the plans were copied across the Netherlands and even inspired their orangery at Versailles. For a literal interpretation of the abundance of lemons in Dutch still life, we must look to food. Available at market and in orangery gardens of the wealthy, lemons quickly made their way into Dutch cuisine, as reflected in both still lives and cookbooks. With the advent of the golden age, food consumption actually increased, the average Dutch family moving from three to four meals per day. Examples from the definitive Dutch cookbook published in 1668, Der Vestinge Koch, The Sensible Cook, include a lemon heart, which is a large meatball, custards, and many dishes of oysters and lemons using every part of the lemon except the seeds and the pit. Lemons are found in over two thirds of recipes from these cookbooks and seem to have been a vital element of a proper 17th century Dutch diet. However, due to their costly husbandry needs, citrus fruits, including lemons, remained a signifier of class through the 17th century, as only the more elite members of society could afford to grow and consume them. To this day, a common household proverb in the Netherlands touches on the epitome of deceit in selling someone nolen voor citronen, or cheap turnips in place of lemons, a testament to their status and value. Another common item in Dutch still life, oysters are rarely seen without lemons. Their acidity works to dry the oysters cold moisture. We still eat them this way this, to this day. Oysters themselves were a quintessential part of the 17th century diet and, and the Dutch painter's vocabulary. Another standard of opulence and luxury with an extra erotic twist. Oysters were rumored to have aphrodisiac powers. This leads us to the next possible reason for lemons predominance in Dutch golden age still lives, which is their presumed ability to offset the warmer humors. Uh, lovesick maidens were given lemon to cool their fiery bodily humors, as recommended by Aristotle for women suffering uterine fits, hysteria, overactive sexual desire, and other erotic ailments. Jacques Ferrand, in his 1610 Treatise on Love Sickness, gives several recipes that include lemon juice or peel as 
Remedies for Love and Erotic Melancholy. Several examples of this can be seen in the work of Jan Stein, whose lovesick maidens are frequently seen with slices or wedges of lemon on nearby tables. But perhaps the best visual is by Richard Breckenberg after Stein with a medical practitioner taking a girl's pulse and holding a flask of her urine from around 1670, in which a swooning, swooning young woman is seen holding a roy, an orange to her groin, presumably to calm her erotic warm humors. Lemons also served a more practical medicinal purpose. Um, von Beverwick in 1672 claims it can render powerless or eliminate the hot or gallish vapors that lie in the stomach. It causes the lost appetite to return, is very pleasant for the stomach, and counteracts poison. I recently had a kidney stone and I was prescribed to put lemon in my water every day. Uh, so it, they really do have medicinal purposes even today. Uh, citrus fruits were also proposed as an antidote to poison. According to a proverb described in Athenaeus and cited in von Beverwick, they were certainly used to balance flavor in the crude, oversweet wine that was served in Romers, which is this wine glass here. Um, it's possible this began as a preventative for poison that ended up having a much more practical use. Uh, Early still lifes of lemons on or near tipped wine glasses may have invited caution, but seem to evolve to have become part of daily consumption habits. So in still life with a Chinese bowl, Nautilus cup and fruit, the lemon next to a cup of wine could perhaps be seen as a reminder to partake of the lemon before imbibing the wine, just in case. Though most likely it is simply uh, culinary and cultural markers that inform this part of cough composition. It is still quite likely that at least some 17th century Dutch art consumers had morality on their mind when looking to still life. But the Netherlands were facing a moral quandary, handling their booming market and economy while dealing with Dutch reformed Calvinist morality that cautioned temperance and moderation. Exotic lemons, obvious signs of wealth and luxury, would have been a clear symbol of vain luxury, um, vanity. And depending on context, could also reference lust, sloth, indolence, and greed. For example, see Jan Stein's 1663 in Luxury Beware, a painting full of pictorial symbols and messages of the price of excess. In the chaos of the disorderly scene, the lemon could be overlooked, left sitting on a ledge, its bright peel spiraling downward, but it draws the eye still, a quiet moment of decadence, sitting actually next to a roamer again. An exotic species whose trees retain their green leaves year round, citrus fruits are also easily poised as symbols of immortality and eternal youth as promised in the Christian paradise. As with the eternal battle of good and evil, lemon, lemons are both bitter and sweet, the aroma pleasant, but the fruit deceptively sour and the pith bitter. Similarly, the pleasure of excess luxury is transient since it satisfies in the moment, but ultimately leads to moral decay. If looked at through this lens, the Vanitas or Pronkstleven painting denote the transient nature of life alongside themes of temperance. The lemons in these picture, particularly when peeled, are ripe, and we know that they will quickly begin to decay. The carpet will fade, the wine will sour, silver will tarnish. The Gospel of Matthew quotes Jesus as saying, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Wealth and excess are hand in hand with several of the seven deadly sins. Death comes for us all. It is the great equalizer. This vanitas genre of paintings may have partially developed for this audience as cautionary devices to visually represent their social and moral predicament. Even today, as scholars have peeled back the many layers of meaning and purpose of Dutch still life, 
It is still a commonly held belief that these paintings served as warning to the newly minted Calvinist citizens of the Dutch Republic, cautioning the danger of pride, gluttony, and excess. Today, scholars agree that there were more likely that these were more likely indication of the rise of consumerism and national pride in their new affluent freedom and status. Perhaps this was tinged with a bit of guilt, most likely found, most likely found pleasure in abundant displays of wealth and comfort as collecting both items and images of expensive and rare items. But whether as celebratory or as cautionary tale implying abundance or temperance, the lemon's ubiquity in Dutch golden age painting cannot be discounted. Plus, as the Netherlands' great empire waned, so did this genre of painting, which seems fitting as if the Vanitas had predicted this eventual decline. Ultimately though, the lemon was utilized frequently by artists as an object of technical fascination, one that fit within popular notions of seeing and depicting. A lemon has a large variety of textures and can exhibit a painter's range of skills as it sits, half peeled to reveal juicy fruit as the elongated spiraling nubby rind drape over the edge of the table, drooping with the heft of gravity. The interplay of color, light, texture and form were all formal qualities that were highly regarded amongst 17th century Dutch painters. Schleven's were a virtuoso test of an artist's skill, an investment of hours of labor layering paint to showcase artistic competency and to evoke the senses. Hoff's still life with a porcelain bowl and nautilus cup is a good example of this. His illusionistic trompe l'oeil Lemon almost evoking salivation, it seems so real. The lemon in particular seems to have served as a challenge for painters, appearing again and again in the work of Den Eil, Van Beren, De Heim, Van Utrecht, Stein, Klaas, but reaching their pinnacle in some of the later works of Kalf. The latter achieves success with his sumptuous and precious object infused Pronkschleven works his exquisite control of light and texture highlighted against dark backgrounds. Clearly, all depictions of lemons should not be reduced to a singular symbolic object. As part of Pronkstelleven or ostentatious, uh, ornate and sumptuous still lives, the interpretation of every lemon would be informed by what surrounded them. Whoops. Calls 1662 still life with a Chinese bowl, a Nautilus cup and fruit, surrounds the deftly peeled lemon with other elements of the Dutch trade industry, while still life with peeled lemon by Jean David de Hum, circa 1650, surrounds the lemon with other fruits. Plump strawberries, grapes, and oysters could all have connotations of sexuality, in particular grapes, which were often related to fertility and virginity. In the end, however, lemons were most likely emblematic of themselves a luxury comestible that for the wealthy art buyers would have a prominent association with daily life and the skill of the painter. Thank you, that is my presentation. This is a, an Italian orangery um, that has been repurposed um, and brought back to become an orangery in modern times. It's the best I could find to show you what an orangery would have looked like. And that's where I end. Thank you very much, Amanda. That was that, that was wonderful to hear. Um, and um, can you hear me okay? Am I coming through? Yeah, yep. Do I have video? Sorry. No, I don't see your video. Okay, hang on one second. Okay, well, I'd like, uh, um, Amanda, I'd like to open the floor to questions and um, I think if, let's see if I can get a good view so I can see everybody. Um, I, Amanda, I don't know if you can see everybody on your screen, but if they, what well, usually works best is people just raise their hands on the screen. Um, yeah. Can you sh stop sharing your screen, Amanda, so we can? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, Matt, I see Matt. Um, okay. Um, 
I'm curious, I mean, I know that you're focused on uh, the medium of painting and the uh, genre of vanitas, but I'm wondering if in this type of research you find examples of lemons in other arts and crafts um, or, or ornamentation or decoration that similarly work uh, symbolically or metaphorically at, at the time. I did, um, especially in fabric with the, the Dutch um, wax, um, the fabric prints. Um, Catherine might be able to help me with it. I'm losing the term right now. Um, the Batik? Yeah, the batik, like the waxy fabric. There, were, there was a lot of uh, citrus imagery in that as well. Um, and in, like you saw the one print in there, the Hesperides. Um, it does, and there were a few other etchings. So it does show up um, in printmaking quite a bit, in illustrations and books, in the batik prints. Um, I did not really look much into sculpture, but um, certainly in, in some of the ceramics from the time that were produced, I mean, I mostly studied in France, there were a lot of, um, a lot of lemon serving um, vessels that were being made just for lemons and other citrus um, dishes. There were, there were specific serving vessels, so certainly in ceramics as well. Um, and, and those would have then just served primarily as symbols of wealth. Um, at the time, right? Uh, I mean, if you look at the, so I had a, an English translation of the cookbook that I had to return through interlibrary loan, but almost every recipe included lemon juice, lemon peel, um, lemon wedges served on the side. Um, and these were, these were cookbooks that ha had to be purchased by people who could afford a cookbook and could read. So they were purchased by people of, of the educated class, so more wealthy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rafael? You're muted. Hi. Um, just a quick, uh, a quick question about scurvy. Um, we know that after 1492 that sailors t packed lemons on their ships across the Americas or across the, the Pacific to get to the Americas. And so I wonder if it, did you run across allusions to the lemon as a, as a cure for scurvy or, you know, it, it seems that that association seems to diminish by the time of the Dutch Republic. Is that right? Or, 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 yes. or, or is it still present? I did look into that quite a bit, Valerie, and I've talked about this. Um, I'm going to share my screen again for a second because um, I have a slide on this. Oh, here's the recipe for lemon heart if anyone wants to make it. A <laughs> heart shaped large meatball. <laughs> it's a heart shaped meatball. It includes pickled green grape juice for this thing called ver juice that was very popular. Um, I found some market scenes that Valerie had, we had talked about, like where it was in the market. And it, it shows up in all these market scenes. Here is an etching from 1636 of Dutch victims of scurvy in a ship hold. Wow. <laughs> Very kind of gruesome. Yeah. So the medical knowledge of scurvy in that time, the Spanish Navy definitely knew about scurvy and they definitely knew how to treat it. Um, and it was, that was information that really was kind of only within the Navy and the, the ship people. And that did not translate to medical knowledge of the general populace because there were, um, the first doctor was 1747. James Lynn publishes a treatise on scurvy and everybody tells him, we don't want to read this. And it gets tossed aside. But, uh, and it's not till 1795 that this idea of the humors and the vapors and such gets, um, kind of turned over into actual scientific knowledge. But in, at various points, you see naval documents where, um, you know, they're, when, they, when Hudson does his expeditions and the, the indigenous people are feeding them lemongrass and what they're calling scurvy grass. Um, and when Cook is doing his tours and his men are getting sick, but then they stop for fresh fruit and they're not being sick anymore. 
Um, the Dusty, Dutch East India Company, India Company had a policy of um, like putting citrus fruits on their ships, but um, it was never written, like it was never documented. It wasn't an official policy. It was just, if your captain was good, he did it. If your captain was bad, he didn't. Um, and literally like millions of sailors died even on Dutch ships um, due to scurvy because of ignorance really and cheap captains. Um, but it was, it was known and it seems like it was also known by the Dutch people just like kind of like common knowledge sort of like um, midwife's tale kind of thing. Um, like put lemon in your tea with honey when you have a sore throat here. It's not official medical practice generally, but um, they did do it, it was practice. Um, so yeah, it, it, no one ever specifically says anything about scurvy in related to the re relation paintings because it was such, it was so endemic in the population that it didn't even have a name. Uh, I think it got a name, I have this written down. 1734, Johann Friedrich Backstrom wrote his observations on scurvy and that's where it got its name. Uh, Jim. Huh. Man, so I may have missed this at the beginning, but um, can you just talk a little bit about why the women? Like what brought you to that as a focus? in the first place, I guess? Um, I found it interesting. It was just there all the time. And I, well, I was actually making my own work with, with this gallery in Seattle called um, Food Art Collection. And the, the owner curator there um, has a gallery just purely based on food. And his main focus is actually golden age Dutch art. Um, and he has this great collection. And I was looking and he, he also, collects modern artists who are working in, in food and so many of them that he's looking at as well are basing their work on Pronkstilevens and still lives. And I, I kept seeing this lemon theme come up and up and up. So I, I just Googled it one day and what I found was fascinating and it kept le leading me further down into this rabbit hole. So I made a show about it that I showed in uh, fall of 2018 back in Seattle called Squeeze which was entirely based on the, the Dutch broke lemon um, that I was using in my ceramic work. And that, it just kind of went from there. I kept doing the research, so I started writing about it. It turns out, you know, 51% of Dutch still lives have lemons. There's something of significance there, especially when Italian works from the, the golden age of that same Baroque age, only 16%. Okay. Um, so this is unrelated, but in the Jan Skeen painting, do you know why the guy had the duck on his shoulder? No idea. Maybe Valerie, you know, I don't know. I think there's a proverb about um, ducks on your shoulder. And of course, oh, you can't hear me. I think, I'm, am I muted or not? No, no you're um, it, I think it's proverbial about a duck on your shoulder. It also just shows that it's um, a, a Jan Steen household. It's all topsy-turvy. Topsy-turvy. Um, yeah, could I ask a question, Amanda? I think I saw Kevin's hand up, but... Uh, Valerie, go for it. Your voice is warmed up. Do it. Okay, well, I was wondering if um, if you want to say something about why there aren't as many oranges, or like, where are all the grapefruit? You know, so there's a whole array of different citrus, so why is it the lemon? So it's, it's interesting. At that time, linguistically, they had not differentiated between different types of citrus fruit. It was all just citronin. Uh, and there are literally, like, like I said, in, in hundreds of different varieties of citrus. And um, I can show this again, because uh, I had a slide on this. Um, if you look, uh, Giovanni Battista Ferrari had this engraving done. And there are 300 pages that all have different types of citrus. And he went, he was a, essentially a botanist who went through and was doing um, all the different uh, types of citrus fruit. And that was 1646. And before that, everything was just citrus. It was citronin, citronin. So um, at this point now we have a, cit a citron is a type of 
citrus fruit. We have lemons, we have Meyer lemons, we have limes and key limes and pomelos and grapefruits. But at that time, no one was differentiating. They were all just this exotic, sour, sweet thing. Um, and so you, if you got a tree from, uh, from the market and it, it grew, you know, mandarin oranges, it was a citrus. Mm -hmm. If the next one grew lemons, they were the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's just so interesting that there's that whole orangerie and the house of orange which is the royal house and then but it's the lemon that shows up all the time and you know instead of the orange i mean that jan stain has the woman holding the orange to her crotch and there's the orange and the arnolfini but typically i think that those still lives are mostly lemons i think it's because by that point they'd started to figure out that the lemons were the astringent ones and the oranges were the oranges were not as the sweet oranges we have now. They were not the Valencian oranges we have now. They were more the bitter oranges, but they were more bitter than the sour of the lemon. And so there was this, a, a, finally a distinction going on. There were, there were some horticulturists starting to work on it. So Kevin, did you want to ask yours? Yeah, I've got a couple questions and one may be way off base, but I'm, I'm wondering if there's, I know the, increased merchant class, there's also increase in things like plagues happening. And I'm wondering if there's any relationship to the antiseptic quality of it um, with lemons. And that's the first question. And the second question is, um, what's a contemporary metaphor today that, that takes the place of the lemon? What All those things, the, the wealth and the, and the balancing of the humors. Um, do we have a contemporary equivalent? Um, well, as far as the antiseptic quality of the lemon, I think it was what they were they were figuring out is that somehow lemons were working for some people um and like I, you know you can take lemon in your tea and it does help um when you have a clear uh, the flu it, it helps you feel better and it is astringent and it is a little bit antibacterial so it, it was they were noticing an effect um that some people were getting better after being treated with lemon so there's yeah. a correlation um I'm, I'm, I'm specifically wondering about plagues because of our current situation right now, I, was, I find it remarkable historically how many plagues there were and how that was a, a fact of modern life to some degree. And, and, and I know that I clean my counters with lemon these days and I'm wondering if there's any, if, if there's any connection there at that point, that they made a connection. Um, I think I talked about this with Trey a little bit. The reason that we still use lemon cleaning products is because um, they use lemons as a cleaning product. Um, lemons, you could mix lemons with beeswax and use it as a furniture polish. And it both like kind of disinfected and it made the beeswax a little shinier when you were polishing your, your wood furniture. And it smells, like we now have an association with lemon and clean smell, which is why you have lemon pledge and all the citrus um, hand soaps. And like my body wash is lemon. And I have noticed, um, this is the thing that I was gonna, possibly work on for my thesis is that lemons, lemon imagery has resurged very um, distinctly recently, um, kind of starting with Beyonce's lemonade. So lemons have kind of twisted around to become a negative thing. Like if there's lemon loss for your car, there's when life hands you lemons make lemonade um, and all of those connotations now. Um, but um, we also like lemons, lemon scent is a clean scent for us. Um, and it, it really dates back to that far when they were using lemons as antiseptic. Um, and I've seen a lot of people wearing lemon print masks. And I think it, it comes to that like sense of like, we don't consciously associate it with clean, but it is a clean sensibility. I don't know that our culture currently has anything um, as relatable as the lemon. It might be like uh, Chanel bags or, you know, actual luxury objects like that, like the iPhone, like which version of the iPhone to have? Do you have a smartwatch? Do you have like actual consumable objects like that? Okay, great. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, I saw Matt first and then Catherine. Matt, you're muted. Okay, uh, there we go. Um, this is also a little bit of a tangent to the the, you know, primary theme and thesis of your work, but 
You mentioned uh, toward the end that grapes uh, were symbols of fertility and vir virginity. And I'm curious about that specificity because, you know, so many of the symbols in Vanitas, uh, they seem um, relevant, like, you know, a soap bubble or an extinguished flame relating to the ephemerality of life. Um, a skull, you know, relating to death. And just the fact that a grape would represent uh, fertility or virginity, I think you said, is surprising to me because I would assume things like, you know, an egg or there would be more obvious uh, symbolic things. So do you know like how a grape relates to those? Um, it's only a grape that's still on the vine. Like, okay. Uh, because once it's been plucked from the vine. Okay. Um, it's, it's just that like really obvious, like it's, it, when it's still on the, the vine, like in the cluster of grapes, it's still a virgin. And then once okay. you it, also, um, it has to do with winemaking. Like when grapes are made into wine, they're no longer like they're processed. It's a little bit like olive oil, like okay. how much it's been processed, virgin, virgin, yeah. virgin. I wonder why just the, the, the general sensibility of ripe fruit. On a on a vine or branch, wouldn't have that connotation. And yeah, the specificity of grapes is interesting. Anyway, yeah, just the, that's my personal curiosity is all. I, I, I a lot of it comes back to like Greek things. Yeah, a lot of it's based on like Greek sensibilities. Look, look at the Hesperides, um, and that golden apple was actually a lemon. Mm. And some Greek myth probably had something about. A grape on a vine yeah and i just yeah, proverbs and the grapes so i didn't really get the depth of that but yeah okay thank you Catherine. so you kind of touched on this a little bit with kevin's question um but i'm curious about where you want to take this research um i heard you answer kevin's question a little bit how the tables have flipped and actually in some senses um lemons have been associated with negative aspects so um where does this research go as you move into the thesis um so what i'm thinking is um that so many contemporary and modern artists have kind of gone back in this direction and looking and are looking at, at still lives and lemons because you see you see andy warhol doing lemon prints you see um there are neon artists who are doing lemon um, like a couple that i know in seattle that are doing lemons out of neon and replicating them over and over um mandy salov a ceramic artist uh, did an installation at Enzika a few years ago where she cast lemons in porcelain and beeswax to talk about fertility and um, the, the life of bees and how they, you have to have bees to get lemons because they pollinate. Um, there are painters and photographers who are working with the concept of still lives and they're still using lemons um, very prominently in their work. Um, Dick, Dirk Stashke, a ceramic artist who came and visited last year, has done, he does Baroque um, kind of paintings, 3D in ceramic, and he did a really beautiful kind of smaller one that has a lemon peeling down. Um, and so this, that, that image of the lemon is still really, um, really common in art. I think it's becoming more common. I'm seeing more artists use it. Um, I'm seeing it a lot in textiles and printmaking and, and painting, um, but it, it, in a lot of different media. And I'm interested in, in asking these artists why and what it means to them and like how this, this image from 400 years ago has come back and become temp contemporary again. Thank you. I think Trey is kind of raising his hand. Uh, Amanda, I'm wondering, it sounds like this was, this kind of started from your own studio research and then transitioned into uh, your art history research. And I'm wondering in the future, as I sit on your MFA committee, do, do you see this, does this tie back in at any time? Or has you kind of left that behind? Or is that something that's moving forward with your current project? No, I would say like the idea of the Vanitas is still very... Um, 
intrinsic in what I'm making. Like it's very tied in. Um, maybe the lemon is not currently a part of it, but all of the, the research into the, the still lives um, is, is there in the work that I'm doing, kind of informing it. Like it's definitely where a lot of this started uh, with, so my, my work, I almost always start with research before I make anything. Uh, and, and this research in particular has been a long time in the making and also like very informative of how I work and what I, what I work on. So yeah. Please. Any more questions? We've got five minutes if anybody's got anything more. Okay, great. Amanda, thank you so much. That was, it was exciting to hear something um, about art. <laughs> um, great. And, um, and at this point, we'll, we'll sign off from this meeting and, um, and the faculty and the tenure track faculty, if you'll join me on the on another on another zoom meeting